Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and pick up with section 12.2. Uh, so the learning outcomes are identifying the three components of the first line of defense, which we introduced in the last lecture, identify the four body systems that participate in that first line of defense, and describe two examples of how the normal microbiota contribute to the first line of defense. Okay, there we go, that should help. All right, so again, the first line of defense is inborn, okay? This is something that is not trained to any particular pathogen. This is very nonspecific, so it recognizes those molecular patterns that are found on the outside of bacteria, things like fimbriae, things like flagella, things that are specific to not human cells. And uh, it comp it's composed of a physical as well as chemical barriers that impede the entry of microbes or foreign agents, whether they are living or not. So, for example, viruses, uh, things that just uh, – so these are the barriers that stop – anything from entering and beginning the infection. And the picture shows a number of these barriers that are provided. Okay. So we're going to start out with the skin. So intact skin is probably our biggest barrier to a lot of things entering uh, our body. So the stratum corneum is the tough outer layer that's impervious and it's waterproof. So that is the very outside layer of skin cells. And the reason that you can basically take a shower, or even use soap, and it's not going to you know, strip a whole lot of your skin off. A few of the dead skin cells may slough off. But by and large, you maintain your barrier even with scrubbing, even with soap and all that sort of thing. Um, you have a constant sloughing off of the outer layers of skin. And so basically, you have several layers of skin cells. You have the living skin cells. And then as it gets further and further up to the surface, the skin cells are dead. And they're just simply left there as the tough coating. The hair shaft also is periodically shed. So in addition to this tough uh, outer layer, you have hair, uh, hairs that grow out through the majority of our skin. And uh, those uh, uh, hair follicle cells are periodically shed, uh, and that's referred to as desquamating or desquamated. Um, and also you have the flushing effect of sweat. Uh, which is uh, from the sweat glands that are also embedded in our skin. Um, and that helps to remove microbes uh, from there. Now, part of the problem when you're a teenager and you have very active oil glands is a lot of times those sweat glands get plugged with that sebaceous oil. That sebaceous, um, those sebaceous glands get, get plugged and that becomes blackheads. And then if they get inflamed, they become what we recognize as pimples. Okay. The next one is the mucous membranes, and those are the membranes that cover the digestive, urinary, and respiratory tracts and the eye. Okay. And mucus itself is something that impedes the attachment of bacteria. You know, mucus is slimy, and there's nothing for those fimbriae to attach onto. It has to get underneath the mucus in order to be able to attach to the skin. Um, for the eye, we have blinking, and that just physically moves some of the microbes. And then we also have tear production, and that flushes microbes off of the eye surface. Um, we have constant flow of, of saliva in our mouth, and that carries microbes down into the harsh conditions of the stomach. So I mentioned previously that the first thing the microbes hit is the stomach acid, and then immediately it's dumped into the small intestine, at which point the pH goes way up and it has to deal with alkaline conditions as well. And typically bacteria have a tough time with that big of a pH swing. And we also have things like vomiting and um, defecation to get rid of things that are uh, noxious, things that are either uh, full of bacteria or have toxins or 
or uh, whatever the body is trying to rapidly get rid of. Um, so uh, in addition to just regular defecation, of course, you also have diarrhea, which is very rapid release of uh, all kinds of things out of the um, gastrointestinal tract to get rid of the bad stuff that it doesn't want to, to keep in the body. Okay, then you have the respiratory tract. Again, that's constantly open to the environment. We're constantly breathing in air that has, you know, all kinds of dust and it's got microbes and it's got all kinds of stuff. Um, our nasal hair traps some of those larger particles. And, you know, when we sneeze or we blow our nose, it just all comes out. Um, but also along our entire upper respiratory tract, we have uh, lots of mucus and you know typically we cough or, or whatever but these fluids continuously provide flushing action to get rid of the microbes to catch them and then to get rid of them we also have these little hair like uh, extensions in our respiratory tract called cilia and these basically uh, behave almost like an elevator so let's say I breathe in and some bacteria comes and gets caught in that those ciliated cells the cilia kind of push the bacteria back up so it's like an elevator and it pushes it back up into my mouth and allows me to either cough or if it gets up into the nose to sneeze uh, those microorganisms out um, so again sneeze reflex gets rid of a lot of air and it gets rid of a lot of critters at the same time um, and uh, coughing is another way that we eject uh, bacteria and other uh, foreign materials that get into our upper respiratory tract. Okay, and here's a picture of that. So typically you'll have a set of ciliated cells and then perhaps a stretch that are not so quite so uh, ciliated, but all of the cilia are able to touch each other. So perhaps you might have them like this and the cilia are able to pass the bacteria from one up into the next to be able to remove them from uh, the respiratory tract. Then we have the genitourinary tract and um, we have a continuous trickle of urine coming from the kidneys through the ureters down into the bladder and periodic bladder emptying flushes the urethra so you have that whole you know uh, liquid trail from the kidneys all the way out through uh, the urethra out of the body and vaginal secretions also are able to clear uh, the vagina of any unwanted uh, uh, bacteria or um, you know, obviously the vagina is, is, uh, has its own microbiome, and so there are bacteria that are supposed to be there. But any pathogens, in part, can be flushed out with all of the vaginal secretions. Um, in addition, uh, part of the first line of defense, as I mentioned, is the human microbiome. And in part, it is just simply because the normal bacteria just literally take over the real estate and they form a barrier between the open part of the, for example, the gastrointestinal tract and the actual skin cells. And so there is no place for these pathogens to land, to be able to uh, attach to the skin and be able to start the infection process. Um, it also can sometimes create a chemical uh, barrier as well. So a lot of times uh, bacteria are able to put out either acid or alkaline substances. So lactobacilli are able to put out lactic acid and that forms a low pH barrier to an awful lot of pathogens being able to attach. Um, one thing I wanted to point out, um, if you think about it, the immune system in our body is supposed to be getting rid of bacteria. Well, clearly the microbiome that normally lives in our colon is not self, but our body is not trying to fight those bacteria off. They have formed a symbiotic relationship. Well, what's the difference between a gram-negative E. coli and you know, a similar gram-negative organism that would be considered a pathogen. Why is it that the gut is perfectly happy to leave those E. coli growing in the gut and not respond to it? Well, again, they have formed that symbiotic relationship. Well, there are a couple of diseases, gut diseases, that are actually thought to be almost autoimmune in nature. So Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis may be uh, an end result 
of having too many antibiotics, particularly as children. And so our gut is not able to form that proper relationship between the microbiome and the immune system. And so uh, if the immune cells are busy attacking stuff that belongs there, then you are leaving yourself open to uh, other infections or simply an autoimmune reaction against the skin cells in the gut itself. And so because it isn't properly trained, it's behaving badly. And uh, both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis are incredibly uncomfortable uh, diseases that really can affect people's lives. And so uh, that's one of the many reasons that we really need to be careful with antibiotics because we want the proper microbiome to be able to form uh, in the children's guts. Okay, so uh, we also have uh, non-specific um, liquid defenses. So uh, I mentioned the sebaceous glands, um, the uh, sweat glands and the oil glands on our skin are meant to be flushing unwanted bacteria from our skin. Uh, from our pores. Um, and basically, you know, it's a flushing action. So by releasing these oils and releasing the sweat, you're able to push the bacteria out of those pores. Um, likewise, we have specialized glands called tear ducts, um, which lubricate the eyes with another type of liquid. And in addition to having antimicrobial properties just in the liquid, there are also certain types of um, antibodies, nonspecific antibodies that also live in, uh, in that fluid that coats the eye as well. Um, there is a um, lysozyme, which is an enzyme that uh, is found both in tears and in saliva that uh, help attack certain parts of the bacteria, in this case, the peptidoglycan layer of the cell wall of bacteria. And so it's an enzyme that helps to digest that when it's in your mouth and um, when it's in your eye to be able to start that process. Um, I mentioned lactic acid in those lactobacilli. We also um, have some lactic acid uh, in sweat as well. We talked about acidic pH uh, in the, um, the skin as well as in the stomach. Uh, we talked about digestive juices and bile in the intestines as well as a rapid increase in pH. Um, there are antimicrobial chemicals within semen to keep that from becoming infected as well. And uh, the vagina, amongst other things, along with having its own microbiome, also is slightly acidic in nature. Just the, the normal secretions are slightly acidic in nature. And that helps to maintain the microbiome that belongs there. And in addition, it helps to flush out and uh, make it an unwelcome environment for pathogens. Okay, so what happens when you lose that barrier? So essentially, once you lose that barrier, you have lost that immune, uh, that, that part of the immune system, okay? Um, one of the most common cases of that happening are burn victims. And people with burns are highly susceptible to all kinds of infections because the barrier that normally keeps a lot of those things out of us is gone. Um, this is one of the places where Pseudomonas aeruginosa can become that opportunistic infection, that opportunistic pathogen, because it very happily lives on the outside of our skin and doesn't cause us any trouble. But when that barrier is gone, uh, Pseudomonas is able to grow, and it is naturally resistant to most of the antibiotics that we have available to us. And so it is really hard to kill once it gets a foothold in that non-intact skin. Uh, likewise, we have blockages in certain types of glands, and if it's not able to flush, it, which is its normal uh, process, then you're at greater risk of having an infection that um, takes hold in those particular area. Now, um, the first line of defense is helpful. It is literally the first line, but that alone is not going to be enough to fight off all of the pathogens that are on us and in us. And so uh, we need some additional uh, mechanisms such as inflammation. And we've talked about phagocytosis where the white blood cells actually engulf the pathogens and digest them. And then um, the last piece of this is the specific immune response. So after we do all those non-specific things, we have that handshake, which then hands the information about the infection over to the specific or adaptive immune 
system. And that then makes a very ser you know, very strong and specific response to that particular pathogen. Okay, so that is uh, section 12.2. So let's go through each of these types of barriers and talk about whether it's a physical or a chemical barrier. Okay, so the first one is the hydrochloric acid of the stomach, and that, of course, is a chemical barrier. The sloughing of the skin, so that's where the skin cells kind of wipe off and, and uh, no longer stay attached to the skin, and that, of course, would be a physical barrier. It's one of the ways that we're able to remove um, the uh, uh, the pathogens attached. That's particularly true inside the gut. The gut lining is sloughed very, very frequently. And so that's one of the ways that we're able to get rid of the pathogens that may have actually physically attached. Um, lysozyme in saliva and tears is an enzyme and it's part of the chemical uh, barrier because it's able to digest uh, the uh, uh, peptidoglycan layer on bacteria. And the ciliary escalator, and that's where the cilia are on in the inside of the respiratory tract, and they do that thing to kind of move the bacteria back up out of the respiratory tract and physically remove it from the body. So that's a physical barrier. Okay, so let's go on to section 12.3, and we're going to list the four major categories of nonspecific or innate immunity. We are going to outline the steps in phagocytosis. We are going to outline the steps in inflammation. We're going to discuss the mechanism of fever and talk about how it helps to defend the body. We're going to name four types of antimicrobial host-derived products. Uh, we're going to compose one good overview sentence about the purpose and mode of action of the complement system, and another about the purpose and mode of action of a chemical called interferon. Okay, so now we're at the second line of defense. So this is uh, where the microbe <clears throat> has breached those outer barriers. And again, this is a very general and non-specific defense. And what I mean by that is that it doesn't go after a particular pathogen. It goes after common features of lots of pathogens. So things like flagella, things like fimbriae, things that are associated specifically with bacteria. It also looks for particular uh, situations uh, with nucleic acids. So double-stranded RNA does not exist in a human being. You can have a single strand that wraps around on itself, but double-stranded RNA, that's not a thing in human cells, but it is a thing in viral cells. And so that's something uh, that our immune system would recognize as a molecular pattern that is viral in nature. Okay, so we have four of these non-specific defenses. So the first one is phagocytosis, which is where the cell engulfs and digests uh, a pathogen. We have inflammation, where you get swelling, so it forces uh, bacterium or, or some kind of infectious particle to stay localized to a particular physical area of the body while the rest of the immune system attacks it. Fever, which is a systemic response, and it raises the body temperature to make it uncomfortable for pathogens and to increase the activity of our own enzymes up to a point. And after it reaches a certain temperature, um, then things start to denature, and that becomes very, very dangerous. And the last one is antimicrobial proteins. Okay, so general activities of phagocytes. So this would be the macrophages and dendritic cells and neutrophils. So these are the, the types of cells that go around the body and surveil. They're, they're looking for bad guys. So they survey, survey tissue compartments and look for those molecular patterns in order to discover microbes um, and also uh, leftover dead skin or I'm sorry, dead um, human cell parts. So if a cell has been lysed by something, it's going to have cellular debris left over. And this is one of the ways that uh, that gets cleaned up so it doesn't stay there forever. Um, also, injured or dead cells uh, that are still intact need to be cleaned up as well. And so all of those phagocytes take care of all of that stuff. They ingest and eliminate these materials. So essentially, they digest them. They, they pull them inside their cell wall or you know, cell membrane and digest them. Uh, and then 
uh, one of the things that they do is they identify any antigenic parts. So they identify unique parts of those pathogens that will be recognized by the adaptive or specific immune system. And uh, basically what it does is it takes those pieces of the bacteria and it puts it on the outside of its cell. And there's a particular set of markers that are all part of the handshake between the innate and the adaptive immune system. But part of that is a piece of the original cell that was digested and is now being put up on the outside of that phagocyte in order to connect with a T cell and get the, the um, specific immune system busy working on that particular pathogen because it recognizes that antigen. So there are three basic types of phagocytes. There are neutrophils, there are monocytes, and there are macrophages, and dendritic cells are, are a part of that as well. Okay, so uh, neutrophils are general purpose phagocytes. Uh, they are an early responder uh, in the inflammatory response to bacteria or other foreign materials that get into damaged tissue. Um, a high neutrophil count is a common sign of bacterial infection. So we've talked a little bit about blood tests that are kind of general in nature. And one of the things that they look for is the count of white blood cells. And they actually look for different components of the white blood cells to see, well, you know, what's going on because certain white blood cells react to uh, a, a helminth infection and others maybe are a little bit higher in a uh, fungal infection and others are higher in a bacterial infection and others are higher in a viral infection. And so that's really indicative of what, the, uh, you know, A, that an infection has happened and B, a little bit of information about what kind of infection is going on. Um, neutrophils are also a primary component of pus. And so when you get, you know, like a, a splinter in your finger and it stays in there for a day or so and all of a sudden you get that pus around it and you know, it makes it much easier to remove, well, basically that's all uh, living and dead neutrophils that have been called in uh, by cytokines to respond to this particular invasion of the uh, first line of defense. Okay, so monocytes are cells which ultimately mature into macrophages after they leave the bloodstream and move into the tissues. So monocytes are the ones that are kind of circulating, and once they leave the, the blood system and move into the tissues, they become macrophages. Um, and there's another particular type of monocyte referred to as a histiocyte. And these are ones that actually remain in certain tissues. And they remain there during their entire lifespan. They do not migrate like monocytes and macrophages do. And so uh, you'll find some uh, in the alveoli of the lung. So that's a place where they need to stay because there's a whole lot of immune system stuff that has to happen inside the lungs. In the um, conifer cells in the liver, uh, dendritic cells that live in the skin. And again, I said that those are a particular type of uh, agocyte that is, uh, that's primarily skin based. Um, and then macrophages live inside the spleen, the lymph nodes, the bone marrow, the kidney, bone, and brain. And their job is simply to surveil and deal with anything that comes through this whole lymph system. Um, other macrophages, their job is basically to drift around inside the blood, uh, inside the blood and, uh, and basically look for uh, bacterial infection. Uh, look for those signs, look for those molecular patterns that would indicate that a bacterial infection has taken place. Okay, so here are some uh, pictures of, of macrophages that are resident in particular tissues. And okay, so we've used this word phagocyte, so what does it mean? So literally it means a, a cell that eats, okay? Um, and the process is actual engulfment, literally grabbing hold of and pulling in. Uh, that is the process of eating. And basically what it does is it attacks foreign cells and it digests them so that you end up with these little pieces that can be waved like flags on the outside of the cell. 
Um, and again, depending on the situation in a particular area, it can be, you know, just one bacteria or one dead host cell um, that just simply needs to be cleaned up, or it can be part of an orchestrated uh, inflammatory event. So all of a sudden there's a, a part of the body that's infected and it needs to be dealt with. And so basically it calls in a bunch of macrophages to deal with the problem. Okay, uh, so we talked about the cytokines that call cells, that is referred to as chemotaxis. So a chemical is released and the purpose of it is to call other cells in. So that's the taxis part. Um, it ingests whatever it is. Uh, the phagolysosome forms and so after it ingests, it forms a, a lysosome in, engulfing that bacteria. Okay, and then all of a sudden those reactive oxygen species that the phagocyte uses to actually digest the bacterium uh, is, are brought in and uh, attached to the lysosome and are used to actually do the digestion. And then the excretion part is where those uh, antigens are identified and put up on the outside of the cell. And then the rest of it is just simply removed as cellular debris, but at that point, uh, theoretically, the bacterium is dead. Okay, so here is a, uh, a table of all of the different steps of phagocytosis. You should know what those steps are. So it begins with chemotaxis. So um, something has detected that there's a bacteria where it doesn't belong, and it sends out cytokines that say, hey, I need more macrophages to come here and clean things up. So that's the chemotaxis part. Uh, the the white blood cell attaches to the tissue where the bacterial infection is. It engulfs the bacteria and forms the phagosome, the phagolysosome, uh, and it kills the bacteria. And then it destroys, the, I mean, that's part of the, the phagocytosis with all of the reactive oxygen species that are thrown at the bacteria, almost like little water balloons, but they're filled with digestive enzymes. Um, and then the elimination. So either it's put up on the outside of the cell or it is removed as cellular debris, as, as junk. Okay, so we talked a little bit about molecular patterns. So these are single molecules that are put up on the surface of these microbes. And these are things that are recognized by the immune system. So flagellin, uh, uh, pillin is another one that's uh, recognized, a double-stranded RNA. All of these molecular patterns are things that are recognized by macrophages based on things that are up on the surface of these macrophages, okay? So the PAMPs, the, the pathogen-associated molecular patterns, are things that are found on the outside of the bacteria, of the pathogen, okay? And this is what is recognized by the macrophage. So typically, these are molecules that are shared by lots of different organisms, but they are not part of the mammalian uh, set of things that are on the outside of our cells. And really what they do is they serve as red flags. And uh, this allows all of the cells of the innate immune system. And then ultimately, that's part of the handshake that happens with the adaptive immune system, the specific immune system. Okay. So examples of things that are bacterial PAMPs, peptidoglycan, lipopolysaccharide. These are things that are recognized uh, in addition, flagellin and, and uh, pillin and those sorts of things. And double-stranded RNA is a classic example of a viral PAMP. This is something that would be recognized as not part of our body. Okay, so the flip side is how does the human cell recognize those PAMPs? And basically there is something on the macrophage which is referred to as a pattern recognition receptor or PRR. And these are found on phagocytes, dendritic cells, endothelial cells, and lymphocytes. And these recognize those PAMPs and bind to them, okay? And so, these, again, are very general things. This is an innate process. So whether a particular macrophage has ever seen a particular PAMP or not, it will recognize it. So every macrophage is going to recognize LPS. Every macrophage is going to recognize flagellin. Okay, these are just molecular patterns that are just built in. They're innate to that part of the immune system. <clears throat> 
Okay, there's also something referred to as an inflammasome. Okay, so these are found within the cytoplasm of phagocytic cells in the innate immune system. And this is done inside the macrophage. So once the bacteria has been brought in and the phagolysosome forms, there are actually additional receptors inside the macrophage. And it also does a surveillance of whatever's been engulfed. And if it recognizes those uh, molecular patterns, it will also start to digest it and then put them up on the surface to do that handshake. And again, the recognition leads to the release of signals that start an inflammatory process and then also start the handshake. Okay, so uh, what are the symptoms of inflammation? Okay, so there's a very classic set of things that we recognize as an inflammatory cascade. So ruber is redness. So typically when you have an inflamed part, say, of your skin, you get a, a mosquito bite. It's going to turn red. And that is uh, basically increased circulation at that particular place where the injury occurred. Okay. The next thing is it's going to be warm, and that's referred to as calor, and that's heat that's given off by that increased blood flow. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. Tumor is a swelling caused by fluid escaping into those tissues. So again, that's part of the whole increased size, and ultimately that fluid, when it's, once the infl inflammatory response is coming back down, that's going to go back into the lymph system to be drained out of those tissues. And dolor, which is pain, and typically an inflamed uh, area is going to hurt a little bit because those nerves are being pinched, they're being squashed, and th therefore stimulated, and so it's, you're going to recognize that as pain. And sometimes you get a loss of function. So if you have a, a finger and it's like this, you know, <laughs> this big, it's not going to bend very well. So you're going to get loss of function in that particular area until the inflammation is, um, is resolved. Okay. Now, in some chronic diseases, such as cardiovascular disease, we have chronic inflammation. So this isn't a response to a particular injury that becomes resolved. This is a constant state of inflammation, and that is very damaging to the tissues over time. This can be something that's local, or it can be something that's systemic. So uh, aging is a consequence of increased infl inflammation. And so if we can do things that reduce the overall inflammatory response over a long period of time, we will not age as quickly. Now, we're going to age, but you know there are some people who are in their 60s who look like they're in their 40s, and other people who are in their 40s who look like they're in their 60s. And part of it is you know, smoking and eating a ton of sugar and drinking a ton of coffee and you know, just basically not taking care of your body, uh, being really, uh, you know, a couch potato and, and not getting enough exercise. All of those things increase inflammatory response, a generalized chronic inflammatory response and are aging. Okay, so what sorts of things elicit that inflammatory response? Okay, uh, so trauma for some, from some kind of infection, uh, would be one thing, some kind of an injury. So again, you know, if you get hit by something, you're going to see, uh, you know, a bruise form, and that's a part of the inflammatory response. The color comes from the blo broken blood cells, but the rest of the response is an inflammatory response. Um, and sometimes specific immune reactions. So, uh, you know, things like uh, eczema is going to cause a localized inflammatory response where uh, you have that autoimmune situation happening inside the skin. Okay. So what's the purpose of inflammation? Um, basically, the first thing is to mobilize and attract other immune cells to the site of the injury. Okay, so there's broken skin cells that need to be mopped up or broken tissue cells that need to be mopped up. There's potentially bacteria that need to be killed. There's all kinds of stuff that, that needs to be done. And so they call in white blood cells to make that happen. And there are also other chemical mechanisms that will kick in when the inflammatory cascade happens that help to repair that d damaged tissue. 
And then, uh, of course, uh, part of it is to destroy any microbes and stop further invasion. Okay, so it's a very powerful defensive reaction. Okay, it can really stop a lot of bad things right in the localized area. Um, it's a means for the body to maintain its stability and restore itself after an injury. So it's in part preventive and in part it's part of the cleaning up process. But if it gets out of control, it can cause tissue injury, destruction, and disease. Okay, so it's one of those things that needs to be in balance to be able to be a, a good thing. Okay, so there are multiple stages of inflammation. So it's a it's a very specific set of events that happen in a particular order. Um, depending on the nature of the injury, it can be a fairly short-lived thing or it can last hours or days. Or, you know, if it's a chronic condition, it can kind of go on almost indefinitely. Once that initial injury occurs, a chain reaction takes place at the site of the damage, summoning beneficial cells like white blood cells and fluid to that area. Okay. So here is an example of an inflammatory response and all of the different things that happen. So the, the step one is the actual injury, uh, and then step two is the vascular reaction, step three is the edema and pus formation, and then step four is the resolution where all that fluid is pulled back out by the lymph system and everything kind of heals back over the scab forms and then turns into um, proper uh, uh, tissue and, and so on. So take a look at that, read that, and uh, that's the inflammatory response is something that you will need to know. Okay, so um, there is a term called diapedesis, and one of the reasons that I thought it was really important for you to understand how amoebas move is because white blood cells, macrophages, and dendritic cells behave a great deal like amoebas. Um, they do all of those pseudopods to kind of crawl along, and uh, in particular, one of the things that white blood cells need to do is leave the circulating blood and enter tissues. And it does that by taking a little pseudopod and kind of sneaking between those skin cells. So it kind of slithers through the space between neighboring skin cells to be able to get into the tissues, okay? So the migration of white blood cells out of blood vessels and into tissues looks very much like an amoeba crawling along. Okay, uh, and this allows them to readily change shape. It allows them to be completely modal. Okay, um, so uh, the the endothelial cells that line things like the the uh, circulatory system, the veins and the arteries, um, they contain adhesive receptors that allow those white blood cells to get through without damaging the tissue. So basically they give, let the white blood cell through, and then they kind of snap back together, okay? Uh, and that allows the white blood cells to enter those tissues. The other thing is chemotaxis. And this is a term that you have heard before uh, relating to bacteria, uh, being able to find food or get away from toxins or something like that. Well, the same thing is true of these white blood cells. There are chemical messages that are put out at the site of an infection that cause white blood cells to migrate to that place. And that is referred to as chemotaxis. The chemo is the chemical that goes out. The taxis is the movement of the cells to that chemical. And you'll find cells swarming from all kinds of places, from compartments uh, all over the body to the site of the infection. So basically, they, they call in the troops. And the troops will come to wherever the chemical is being uh, released. And they will deal with whatever the infection is. Okay. Here is a picture of what we were talking about, about diapedesis, where the white blood cell kind of puts a little pseudopod out between um, the skin cells and is able to move out of the blood, uh, the blood vessel into the tissue that it needs to work in. Okay. Now, edema is uh, the buildup of fluid in a localized area as part of the inflammatory response. Um, and the other 
piece of the fluid being there is you have to uh, have the skin become kind of leaky and allow that fluid into the tissue in order to cause the swelling. Okay, so there are a number of benefits. So first of all, that fluid is going to dilute any toxic substances. So a lot of pathogens put out toxins. Well, by having additional fluid there, you're just simply diluting those. Um, a fibrin clot, so things that come with plasma include things that help clot, um, and the clot will literally block off access of the microbes to other parts of the body, so it prevents further spread. Um, neutrophils are attracted to sites of inflammation, and so there you get pus, you get um, things that are uh, going to phagocytose uh, bacteria and other uh, organisms. Um, so pus is the accumulation of whitish mass of cells. So white blood cells are in there. The neutrophils are in there. Uh, some of the cells in the pus are alive. Some of the cells are dead. Um, but basically, it causes a localized area of liquefied cellular debris, bacteria, and white blood cells. And so that can be removed when, when the um, area kind of pops then the white the pus comes out and with it the bacteria and all of the other uh, stuff now pyogenic means something that causes the formation of pus and there are certain kinds of bacteria that really stimulate the formation of pus streptococci staphylococci gonococci and meningococci are four uh, groups of bacteria that really will form a huge amount of pus. They, they just simply cause a huge influx of neutrophils to the area where the uh, infection occurs. Okay, fever. Um, it's an abnormally elevated body temperature, okay? Almost always it's a symptom of infection. We don't normally get a fever unless we're dealing with some kind of an infection. Um, it's associated with certain allergies, cancers, and other illnesses, okay? So there are cases where we will have a fever without an infection, but the overwhelming majority of times when there's a fever, you have an infection that you're dealing with, okay? Um, if you get one of those that you don't understand it's a fever of unknown origin or an FUO. Okay, so typically our body temperature is maintained around 37 degrees Celsius or 98.6 and that is maintained by a part of the brain called the hypothalamus and basically it's always measuring and adjusting to kind of keep everything constant. So a low-grade fever of 100 or 101, people don't usually get too worried about because it's actually helping. Um, and so unless there's some medical reason, we typically don't even mess with that. Um, unless you're incredibly uncomfortable, I wouldn't even take a Tylenol or a, an Advil or anything. Just let it work its way out and um, let the body do what it needs to do. A high-grade fever, on the other hand, of 104 to 106, there you're talking about tissue damage. You're talking about permanent... Um, denaturization of enzymes and proteins and that will cause permanent damage and so that's something you have to uh, take care of. Okay, um, so pyrogens are things that cause a fever, okay, and they can do that by resetting the hypothalamus, okay, so we've talked about these systemic effects. This is one of those systemic effects, okay, so uh, there are pyrogens that are actually products of certain fungi and bacteria um, and viruses, and uh, basically these are things coming from outside the body that cause the body to raise the temperature. Um, endogenous pyrogens are things that can be caused by cells within the body, okay, um, and certain chemicals. So interleukin-1, which we're going to be talking about a little bit later, is something that will cause a fever. Uh, tumor necrosis factor is another one. It's a, a chemical that's released by certain cells in the body, and it will cause a fever. So there are benefits to fever, okay? So uh, it inhibits certain temperature-sensitive bacteria. So if you raise the temperature beyond where it's comfortable, it's not going to be able to uh, uh, reproduce as quickly. And so your immune system is going to be able to get on top of it, okay? Um, and it also uh, stops the bacteria from being able to metabolize iron. And that's a really important chemical or a really important nutrient for uh, bacteria in particular. 
um, it also increases the function of our own enzymes. Um, so it speeds things up like um, hematopoiesis. It makes blood cells faster. Phagocytosis, that happens faster at a slightly higher temperature. Specific immune reactions, okay, all of those are driven by that slightly higher temperature. Okay. Um, so again, I think the normal course of business these days is a low grade fever. You just don't mess with it. You know, just let it run its course and it will be fine. Um, a slightly higher fever in an otherwise healthy person. Okay. As long as you don't reach the temperature where you're starting to denature proteins and cause permanent tissue damage, the body knows what it's doing and you ought to let it run its course. Um, but, um, you know, once it hits a certain point, then you really do have to intervene. Otherwise, the person is going to have permanent damage. So high and prolonged fevers uh, have to be treated. People who have cardiovascular disease, head trauma, seizures, or respiratory ailments are also at uh, a higher risk of having damage at lower temperatures than a normal healthy person. And so there may be underlying medical conditions that will change that. But for an otherwise healthy person, let the fever run its course because it's doing its job. Okay, there is another set of chemicals called interferons, and these are small proteins that are produced by white blood and certain tissue cells. And originally we thought interferons were specific to viruses, but it also helps with other microbes as well. And it's also part of the whole immune regulation system and intercommunication between various pieces of the immune system. So there are alpha and beta, beta interferons, and these are produced by lymphocytes, fibroblasts, and macrophages. Okay? Interferon gamma is produced by T cells. And again, these are all chemicals that are used largely for pieces of the immune system to, um, to talk to each other and to pass information along about how the, uh, the various parts of the immune system should respond. Okay, so interferons do a number of different things. So first they will bind to cell surfaces and actually induce changes in genetic expression. Okay, so they will cause certain genes to be turned off and other genes to be turned on. All three interferons can inhibit the expression of certain cancer genes. So they have tumor suppressive effects and that's why they're called tumor necrosis factors because they suppress the development of tumors. Um, interferon alpha and beta stimulate phagocytosis, and that's obviously a really important thing if you have some kind of a bacterial infection. And interferon gamma is a huge regulator of the immune system, particularly macrophages as well as B and T cells. And so, again, this is a huge uh, communication mechanism and is uh, a really important piece. Okay. So, Interferons do a number of things. So they do bind viruses, and that's one of the reasons that they were originally thought to be antiviral. Okay. Um, and other microbes, uh, basically by uh, uh, certain receptors being bound, causes the release of interferons. So there is more of a communication kind of a feature uh, for that. When that happens, interferon molecules are rapidly secreted into the local intracellular or extracellular space, and they bind to other host cells. So that interferes with the ability of that virus to go to the next cell to infect it. Okay, so you're kind of corralling it into a pen using this interferon. Okay. Uh, Binding of interferon induces the production of certain proteins inside the cell that actually interfere with that viral life cycle. Okay, so they degrade viral, viral RNA and uh, they prevent translation of certain viral proteins. Okay, so they basically stop the, the life cycle from happening in addition to blocking the spread in the local area. It's not microbe specific, so it's a generalized response. Um, but it's extremely valuable for treating a number of virus infections. And in fact, in some cases, it's given exogenously. It's injected into people who need additional interferon, and it's very helpful in those cases. Okay, so again, here's a picture of all of the things that we just talked about, about how interferon is able to uh, interfere with that viral life cycle. Okay.
I'm going to stop here and I will pick up in the next lecture talking about compliment.